From the CPRI Knowledge Hub and CPRIHub.org, this is Research Minutes, a deep dive into new and important research in the realm of education. I'm Peter Horn. Today, we're looking at New York City's school improvement industry, those external groups and organizations that work with city schools to meet specific goals. It's an industry so large that it can be difficult even to measure. You know, there's no place to go to find out how many of these organizations there are. You know, there's no list, there's no one place, no one at the Department of Education that you can ask who's, who knows about all these. We're speaking with CPRI and Columbia University researcher Thomas Hatch, co-director of the National Center for Restructuring Education, Schools, and Teaching. Hatch recently set out to map those organizations working to support K-3 reading in New York schools and understand how they operate, interact, and impact education. Again, we found that a uh, small number of these programs, it was roughly you know, 27 or 28 or something like that, were getting expertise from something like 75 different sources. And they ranged from conferences of the National Council of Teachers of English to the, to the Huffington Post. So again, it suggests this is a highly diverse and fragmented sector. Hatch sits down with CPRI senior researcher Ryan Fink to discuss his findings and their potential implications for teachers, researchers, and education policymakers across the country. That's right now on Research Minutes. Welcome. I'm Ryan Fink, senior researcher with CPRI at the University of Pennsylvania, and today I'm joined by Thomas Hatch, professor of education at Teachers College, Columbia University, and co-director of the National Center for Restructuring Education, Schools, and Teaching. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Ryan. I'm happy to be here. So today we're looking at your new study centered on uh, K-3 reading in New York City, and specifically the role played by what researchers tend to call the school improvement industry. Can you describe what this is and why you set out to study it? Uh, sure. I mean, I think the school improvement industry is a term that's getting used more and more these days, uh, but it's pretty ambiguous. Uh, in general, it refers to all of those organizations and people that are providing materials or services or expertise to help schools improve. And so, you know, that can include tutoring programs. It can include for-profit, not-for-profit enterprises, you know, individual consultants or university programs uh, that focus on curriculum or assessment development or research, uh, you know, designed to, to support uh, schools. So it's, it's really uh, a, a big group of uh, programs and people. And I, I found it fascinating because, you know, I started working on what you could call, you know, one of these consulting organizations back in the 1980s. And when we started working with schools at that time, all of a sudden, I realized we were bumping in, into in the hallways, all these folks from other organizations, people we knew from AERA and other conferences, some, you know, former colleagues, all of whom who were trying to work together or, or work individually on their various programs to support improvement in these schools. So I actually wrote an article back in the 1990s called When Improvement Programs Collide that described really the challenges when so many programs and people are trying to work with schools and schools really don't have the capacity to really take in and use that expertise as productively as possible. That article really struck a chord. And unfortunately, the problem has just continued. I think there are a lot of people who are paying more attention to it and who are trying to work on it. But in fact, there are more and more of these organizations and consultants who are trying to work with schools and we still haven't figured out how to use it most productively. In fact, the Carnegie Corporation just came out with a report where they're trying to bring some folks from outside schools together to think about ways to support and promote coherence in school improvement strategies and work in schools. So it's still a big problem. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it sets a great context for the work that you did in New York. I did some work. Actually, it was part of my dissertation. I looked at district-led instructional improvement effort in categorized as a remote town in the Midwestern United States, because of the size and the location of this school district, they did have external providers that they were working with, but they weren't overwhelmed by them. They weren't, you know, having to deal with these conflicts that you just described in terms of people working against one another or, or on the same efforts, sort of 
parallel play kind of things. Instead, because they didn't, they weren't overwhelmed by sort of this influx of offers of support and, and having to fend those off, they were able to be much more sort of thoughtful about which of those offers they took on and how they fit strategically in what the district was trying to accomplish. I think that's a really key point, and it relates to why we were doing in, in the work in New York, but it's really highly context dependent. And the first thing you have to ask is, so what are the circumstances in the context? Are there a lot of these providers? Some places don't have enough. Other places have way too many. Some don't have the kind that they want. But the point is we need to get much better at thinking about what the available expertise is that's needed and how to make sure that we get that expertise to the places that need it in the ways that are most uh, powerful and effective. So can you talk more specifically then about the study in New York and sort of what you were hoping to learn and find out? Yeah, this really came to the forefront in New York City when Brooke Astor, the heiress who had a large estate uh, when she passed away at the age of over 100, she dedicated a significant portion of her estate to improve literacy and reading in New York City public schools in particular. And she organized that this money or her heirs, uh, the, uh, those who were in charge of her estate, asked the New York Community Trust to oversee it and to develop a, a competitive grant program to get some of this money out to organizations and programs that could work with New York City public elementary schools to improve reading outcomes. And as part of that work, we were talking to the folks who were who were organizing the effort and were trying to develop an evaluation to go along with it. And what we realized is they were asking asking these organizations to write in and explain how they were going to use these funds, but nobody really had a good sense of how many organizations there were out there, exactly who was doing good work, what kind of work was being done. So even if you ask people to estimate how many organizations are there that are out there trying to help New York, just New York City elementary schools, because that's where the money was focused, how many are trying to help New York City elementary schools uh, improve reading outcomes? Nobody had any idea. So, so this work has really been designed to get a sense of, you know, not just how many organizations and people are out there doing this work, but exactly what kind of work they're doing, and then to figure out what we can do to try and make sure that all of this work adds up to more than the sum of its parts and really has a much more powerful and catalytic effect on reading in New York City. In order to get to that second part that you just described, you first, as you said, had to sort of do a lay of the land, right? Get a general sense of the landscape of who are these folks? How many of them are there? And sort of what are their purported sort of purposes and what are, what do they think that they're doing or what are they focused on when they work with schools? So how did you go about getting your hands around that and understanding what does the general landscape look like? Yeah, well, the first challenge was really that, you know, there's no place to go to find out how many of these organizations there are. There, you know, there's no list. There's no one place, no one at the Department of Education that you can ask who's, who knows about all these. Even if you, you know, and I had this experience in the 1990s, I did a survey where I asked a bunch of principals how many different programs were working in their building, and none of them knew because they weren't the only ones who were making and developing these relationships. Teachers were doing it, coaches were doing it, other administrators were doing it. In some cases, parents were bringing organizations in. So, so it's a really challenging problem. So the first thing we had to do is really define which organizations or programs are we talking about in this case. And we actually made the, the net fairly small, in a sense, and we focused only on those programs that were working either directly with students or directly with teachers in a New York City public elementary Entry school at the K-3 level directly on improving reading outcomes. And so that meant we weren't even looking at anyone who was doing independent curriculum providers, uh, materials producers. We didn't even touch any of those or many of the tutoring programs that aren't situated directly in a particular school. Once we made that definition, we then had to go to a lot of different places. We went to the records of foundations. We looked at uh, what programs that some of the top funders in New York City, who they were funding. We did interviews with people at the DOE, with other funders who identify programs and review the list that we were developing. You know, New York City does keep a list of approved providers, but you know, don't know how many of those still exist, how many of those are actually working in the school. So it was a fairly complex process, but eventually pulled together a list. And what we found was 112 different programs that met
met those criteria, either providing support to teachers or students, you know, over the summer or some significant period of time, like a semester or a full year, 112 different programs. If we'd only found 30 or 40, then maybe we could have gone to all of them and really had a close look at exactly what they were doing and what their purposes and goals were. Then we had to develop a representative sample of different types of programs, after school programs, in school programs, programs working with teachers, programs working with students, and and develop that sample. And then once we did that, we did interviews and a survey basically to ask about their goals, whether they had evaluations that had shown their effectiveness, whether or not they were doing assessments to monitor their progress or effectiveness, whether they had trained personnel or things like that. And through that process that, that we really came to see that these organizations did, for the most part, have goals that were specifically focused around reading, in some cases focused specifically around raising student achievement on typical New York's ELA tests, or possibly sometimes about helping teachers to improve their instructional practice in reading or to implement the Common Core standards. So it really was uh, interesting to see what they they had as a focus. So there were there were some arts based programs where reading was kind of along with a, a set of other goals related to socio emotional learning or arts development and things like that. But it also showed that almost all the teacher programs were hiring staff that at least had a BA and in many cases already had a master's or a teaching credential and had experience teaching. And even the programs that were working directly with students, even though they might be taking volunteers or things like that, and didn't always require even a BA, and in some cases they might be having college students providing tutoring, they were almost always providing training for those. So there's a sense that in this group, you really had resources and expertise and goals that were, that were relevant. Did that 112 number surprise you? Yes and no. I mean, I think... I mean, even for a city the size of New York, I think 112 is a lot. When you take into consideration it, we're only talking about those, it, it's really a very narrow slice of this school improvement industry. I think the fact that there was 112 just focused on that small area, that was surprising to me. So as you moved into that that next phase there, what did you find? Well, so there were really two parts of it. The first part is to say, well, could this, what we call the reading improvement sector at the elementary level in New York City, could they have a a significant collective impact on reading in New York City? And so the first part of that question is, were they connected to enough schools to actually have some kind of systemic impact? Because again, each one could only be working with one school or something like that. But ultimately, we found that these programs, and again, we're talking about a sample of 26 or 27 in this case. We had information about how many and which schools they were working with. We found that at 26, six or 27 of those programs were connected to something like, I think I, it's in the report, I think it's 16% of all of the ele- public elementary schools in New York City and 26% of those in the Bronx, a much higher concentration in the Bronx and upper Manhattan, suggesting these programs just in, the, in this sample could really have be a good foundation for kind of a systemic effect. And particularly if you look broadly at the 112 programs in the sector. So that was interesting. But then the second question is, to what extent are they working together? Are they focused on common goals? Could their work be kind of a foundation for a more powerful impact? And I think there, the the analyses raised a lot of questions because what we found is their goals really varied considerably. Some might focus on phonics-based instruction or more vocabulary or comprehension, particular discrete skills. Others focused on common core standards and work with teachers. Teachers. Some just focused on just improving, kind of getting students to read at grade level. And, and it was really a mixed bag, but again, a mixed bag that reflects the mixed bag of policy priorities that I think we've had in reading around over the last 15 or 20 years or so. So perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by that. But again, there really wasn't a sense of these are organizations that are developing a set of common goals or a common approach. 
And then the second part of that, and, and I don't think many people have really looked at this with these kinds of programs. We were looking at, you know, the relationships amongst these sample programs. We did a social network survey where we asked, you know, someone in the organization to say, how often do people at your organization talk to or communicate with people at any one of these other 112 organizations? Which ones of these organizations are you involved in a uh, collaboration or partnership? And what we found is uh, roughly a little less than half said they were in what would be considered regular kind of monthly communication with other organizations, which is generally considered to be about the, the standard for being able to share useful and productive information and developing common expertise. And a little more than half said that they were working in partnership or collaboration with you know at least one other organization. So there's some sense that about half of these organizations are working with one other, right? But that's out of 30 or 40 in the sample or 112 in the entire sector, and it's not very much. And what we found in particular was that a lot of the organizations and programs working with teachers were the least likely to be connected to or working with other organizations. They were largely working on their own. Interesting. It sounds like the potential to have that collective impact certainly seems to exist. However, you also found general sort of uh, a general lack of coherence in terms of the types of either skills or strategies that different organizations would focus on in the schools. And then also that there's a general sort of lack of connectivity and sort of collaboration between organizations. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's that's a that's a good summary. And I, I would just add, we kind of upped the ante by asking each each organization to tell us where they got their financial support and you know who their funders were. And that funding comes with different requirements, different expectations. And we found, in fact, I think about 21 of those were funded by private foundations, and they were funded by 56 or 57 different funders, all of whom have different uh, kinds of expectations. So they're not only not working together with each other, they're working with a tremendous amount of other partners, which I think increases the diversity. And then we asked one more question, which is, where do you get your literacy expertise? Because if they all went to the same places, the same institutions, research pro, you know, whatever to get the same, you know, they might be getting a coherent set of research to build on. But again, we found that a small number of these programs that was roughly 27 or 28 or something like that, we're getting expertise from something like 75 different sources. And they ranged from conferences of the National Council of Teachers of English to the Huffington Post. So again, it suggests this is a highly diverse and fragmented sector. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned that the providers specifically that were offering assistance to teachers were often not in alignment with with one another. And so, you know, my image obviously goes to the to the teacher that, you know, we go in to talk to and says, well, I'm getting four different messages from four different people. And so at some point, I just throw my hands up. But just curious from from your end, sort of where you went in your head in terms of implications, in terms of future research? Well, I, I think the first thing is is just to kind of step back and, and look at the problem again and to say there's a supply side of the problem and there's a demand side. So I think a lot there's a lot of work that's been done. The What Works Clearinghouse is an example where people have tried to, in a sense, monitor the providers and identify those that are the most effective, those that have practices that work, that are research tested, and to make sure and to try and you know put policies in place and to create information, just to, to make sure that schools only work with a certain providers and to, to and winnow the supply down to those. That has never worked. There's a lot of reasons why that's difficult. For one, it's really hard to prove what works at the kind of scale that the What Works Clearinghouse expects. That doesn't mean that these programs aren't useful and productive in other ways. So there are a lot of issues. So that supply side solution hasn't worked. The other side is where, you know, we eliminate the demand. If we improved reading instruction, then New York City wouldn't need all this outside help. But we've seen over and over again for years that states and districts, they don't have the capacity to provide the kinds of improvements in instruction that all students require, and particularly for those working in the lowest performing schools in the most difficult circumstances. So eliminating the demand hasn't worked. So, you know, my feeling is we need to come to the realization that there's not going to be an adequate supply and of 
you know, kind of proven programs, and there's still going to be demand. So then what do we do? And from my perspective, there are about, you know, four things that can be done. One is just sharing information on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be every year. It could be every five years. Just taking a look. Who are these programs? What are they doing? Which ones have, you know, should we really be paying attention to? Should we hold up and say, look, this is great work. Let's let more people know about it. I mean, we have a map in our research brief that shows where different programs are working and which parts of the city. Just sharing information about that can help people make more strategic decisions about, you know, where help is needed and which kinds of um, schools need which kinds of support. But beyond sharing information, then there's work that can be done to support coordination. So that might be bringing providers and maybe some schools or folks from the DOE and other researchers involved in reading together on an annual basis to try and identify kind of key strategies that different organizations could try to work with and work with different schools. So it might be to prioritize uh, vocabulary instruction or it might be to uh, promote nonfiction reading. I mean, whatever it it is, these organizations could try to develop some common practices, even as they have a variety of different goals and approaches. A third thing is really to promote kind of strategic partnerships. You were talking about the teachers might have this problem that they're getting feedback from four different programs or whatever that are pushing them in different directions. Well, the reality is many of the teacher programs won't work in places that already have another teacher program working. There. So, you know, on the one hand, you know, you you aren't always getting as much uh, as much of a oversupply in a particular classroom approaches to teaching reading. On the other hand, there's tremendous competition for funding and resources amongst those programs focused on teachers that discourages the kind of collaboration that I think could move the whole field forward. But on the other hand, there's a lot of room for strategic collaborations between, say, programs working with teachers and after-school programs or programs working with directly with students. If those programs communicated a little bit, figured out how to um, support one another's work more effectively, I think that could really help to um, expand the uh, the impact of both programs. And then finally, I, I think, and you alluded to this in the beginning when you talked about the work in the smaller uh, community, if we find the right size, the right you know neighborhoods or the, the right size districts, it's possible to have a more comprehensive solution where you bring the providers and the people, students and teachers and parents together um, to really think strategically about collective impact and how we pull in the, the right kinds of organizations and expertise, develop the expertise that we don't have, and make sure it's working uh, across our uh, schools within that particular uh, w- within that particular area. And there, there are groups like the Pinkerton Foundation has created an initiative called East New York Reads, which I, I think is you know a, a model for that kind of collective impact on kind of a neighborhood scale. Those are great and thoughtful sort of suggestions, implications of how some of that problem that you laid out to begin with might be remedied in terms of never having sort of this verified list of providers, but at, at the same time having a real need for it uh, in the schools. I guess I'm, I'm left with wondering who does this work? Uh, does it fall on the school district? Does it fall on them to prioritize uh, this work in terms of who incentivizes these providers to to do the sharing and the coordination and the formation of partnerships that you're mentioning here? This is a great question. And it's one that came out of the work that I did in the 1990s. Who is it uh, that's going to take the lead. Uh, you know, we could say that it's it's really up to the school district, and to a certain extent, it is. But you know, the superintendents and the administrators in those districts, in some ways, they are caretakers for the community. Um, they are not on their own, and they're going to come and go. So, and the folks in the community, for the most part, are going to be the ones who stay there. So, it has to go beyond just the district. Um, there have been, though, it should should be pointed out, some districts, I think Charlotte, I think St. Louis has done it in the past, where they've really tried to spearhead these efforts. But I would argue it really has to be a collective effort. All of us have to recognize those who are working in schools that are part of the district or part of a school administration have to be a part of it. But so do the support providers and so do the funders and so do the policymakers at the state and national level. The researchers have to be part of it. We all have to recognize that we have a collective responsibility for doing this work more effectively and making sure that our work fits in in ways that supports the work not only going on in schools, but the work that our colleagues are doing. 
Great. Well, Tom, thanks so much for being here today and, and sharing about this really interesting and worthwhile study. Well, thank you, Ryan. I really enjoyed the chance. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. For more episodes or to subscribe to the podcast, visit us at ciprihub.org. That's C-P-R-E-Hub.org. To hear more of me, Peter Horn, you can follow the Point of Learning podcast on your favorite streaming service or at hornedconsulting.org. To share your thoughts on today's episode or to suggest future topics, find the CPRI Knowledge Hub on Twitter at CPRI Hub. We look forward to you joining the conversation.